Cool. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Michael Edwards. Um, today, um, I'm going to do basically a workshop on bioinformatics. And what we're going to analyze is actually real world data, um, not one study, but actually about 15 different studies um, using a, the JUMP program. Um, if you have not downloaded that, um, I'm going to give a little just kind of a brief introduction to the data set and what some of the things that we'll be doing. Um, if, if you haven't downloaded it, please do that now. Um, oops, there we go. Oh, there we go. Um, so today, what I'm gonna try to hopefully convince you about is that the true power of bioinformatics isn't to analyze your own data, it's to analyze everybody else's. And why I say this, so what you're looking at right now is the, the website for Gene Expression Omnibus. And hopefully some of you have heard of that before. And, and I bet some of you haven't. Um, you really, if, if you're getting into research, you should know this data site because this is pretty much where we're putting all our data. And if you look on this little side right here, there's actually almost 140,000 different studies in GEO right now containing about 4 million samples. There is lots and lots of cures, lots of lots of just insight into all this data. The problem with gene expression omnibus and if people out there that have used it, it is a pain in the butt to get information out. And not only that, but then you have to compare it. Like if you're getting more than one study, you have to figure out a way to normalize all these studies to each other. Um, Obviously, this is a lot of work. Um, I'm all about, so in bioinformatics, you always take, you know, Occam's razor, the straightest, straightest line to what you want. And so what I've done is I've been working with a company, I'm sure you've all heard of Illumina. Um, they do about 95% of all the sequencing on this planet. Um, if you know somebody that works there, make friends with them because <laughs> they're gonna rule the world here in a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, they're very good with data. And what they've done is they've realized that people would want all this information in one place. So they, they created this thing called Correlation Engine. Um, and this is actually the 2.0 version that we're working on. So they've actually gone into GEO, what I've just shown you, and they've downloaded all that data. And they've basically created a, a database so that they've, they've done all the statistics, they've done all the annotations. So what you're actually getting back are, are basically changes in gene expression based on, a, on some kind of control in all of these different studies. And if you look back, you, you saw that there's 140 different studies in, in GEO right now. Right now, there's about 21,000 different studies in Correlation Engine. So they've gone through the whole thing, what they've done, except the, the most recent stuff, they've got rid of most of the things that, you know, weren't statistically significant or it was just a bad study. And if you can see here, I mean, this is less than 25% of everything that's in there. So that's another nice about using this database is it actually does the controls for you so that you're not worried about is this even a, a good data set? You don't have to do the quality controls on it. They've already done it for you and they've done the statistics and put that information in here. So today I, I've used this. Um, I don't know if, I'm sure you all were bored as heck during the pandemic. Maybe you weren't, <laughs> I was. <laughs> so I, I called up you know, my, my friends that I work with at Illumina and they basically said, hey, um, I, I was like, I'm bored you know, why don't we see what we can do with this pandemic? And so that's actually, you know, why don't we go in, get some data and actually just start analyzing, you know, the SARS-CoV, you know, host response data and see what we can find. Um, they were all about it. Um, and actually what they've done is we've created a COVID-19 community. So we've actually correlate, we've, we've combined all of this data into one place on this correlation engine database. And what I will be talking about today is the SARS-CoV-1 curated studies. And right now we have, there's 34 different studies containing this information in, in this database. Uh, when I first started, there was actually, there was no CoV-2 curated studies in the database. So that's a lot of times when you do in bioinformatics, if you can't get a lot of data on what you really want, find something very similar. And I've done this in cancer plenty of times. 
And it actually worked out really well. Uh, I'm going to tell you why CoV-1 works so well with CoV-2. So again, there's 34 studies here. Um, this is just a, this is from a journal article kind of comparing different coronaviruses. I think there's like eight or nine different coronaviruses. Most of them are not lethal or actually are kind of like the, the common cold. Uh, there were three coronaviruses that, that started pandemics in the recent history. Um, we've got MERS, SARS-CoV, and then the current virus is SARS-CoV-2. What is nice is that when we compare this SARS-CoV-2 to SARS-CoV, there's actually 79% homology at the genetic level. So these are very similar viruses. Not only that, but that they are believed to come from the same origin, that they both have a share a bat origin. They both attack the same receptor, and this is different from MERS, that both the SARS-CoV-2 and CoV-1 um, attach to the ACE2 receptor, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about that. So common entry, similar symptoms. You have you know, very similar symptoms and um, pathology associated with these diseases. But the one difference here is that actually the one we'll be using today, SARS-CoV, was more severe than the current epidemic. And that's probably why the SARS-CoV epidemic, it was in 2002, 2003, died out. It was probably too severe. It limited their host in infecting other people because they'd be so sick, they'd just stay in the same spot. Um, it, this actually works out well because, I mean, if we're going to look at the bad things coming from the current epidemic, it's nice to find a version of that that is actually more severe. So this is what we are doing. We are looking at SARS-CoV, and we're going to use that to try to figure out the current ep epidemic, SARS-CoV-2. Quick question, sir. Yes. Uh, in the constructs at the top, towards the uh, three prime end, there's an upper and lower nomenclature. I've not seen that before. Can you uh, make some sense out of that? Rather than just, uh, <laughs> sure. Card? Well, I mean, it's, it's all basically it's showing you where it is. These are just all domains. Um, right. Yeah. They, they're, they're all on the same strain, right? There's not okay. like four yeah, different strains. Of, so all they're doing is that they're just kind of packing it, trying to put it so that you can kind of see where, where all this okay. is. Okay. Fair enough. Out. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Okay. Um, obviously, if you are, you know, if we're looking at this virus, um, you know, what we are going to study today is not what's coming off the virus, it's how this cell responds to this virus. Um, this is just a diagram. I think this was one from Invivogen. I'll put this out. Um, here's your SARS-CoV-2 binding to the outside of the cell. This is ACE2, and this is kind of a peptidase that's associated with that entry. But again, you have, at, once the virus is recognized, there are all kinds of genes that are expressed, thousands and thousands of genes in response to this virus. Uh, it can be in response to the proteins. It can be in response to the double-stranded RNA itself, all kinds of different things. And there's signaling pathways to alert the surrounding cells as well, you know, hormones that are given off. Um, here is just kind of giving you some of these, these different ones. I mean, we're not really going to get into the majority of this, but just to say that as the virus infects the cell, it's, it's, there's almost like a napalm response. There's like type one and type three type interferon responses. And that you kind of have this as, as soon as the virus or the virus is recognized by the cell, it's almost like this alarm system, this scream. This is the primary inflammatory response. Um, and it involves inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-6 is a really big one, TNF-alpha. I'm sure some of you have heard of those. Um, you also have very specific, so this is more just in general, I'm in trouble, I am yelling, I'm expressing lots of genes to alert for danger. Um, you can also have things that are specific to viruses and interferons are very, definitely big in that. Um, here given is to alpha and beta interferons, uh, which induce lots and lots of genes that will go and 
they will express those genes, they will be secreted, and then they will alarm other cells even before the virus comes to tell them, hey, you guys got to get ready. We're getting a huge invasion. Um, this is kind of the primary response. And then you have this kind of secondary response. So this is more like you're dropping bombs. And then now you, you bring out the sharpshooters, the specialists, and they come out. And this is the, the adaptive immunity. So what you're doing is you're, you're now making specific antibodies against things on the protein. So you can actually just target it directly. And this involves all kinds of different signaling mechanisms as well. What happens in infection and in the bad outcomes that come with the current epidemic with COVID-19 is that this inflammatory loop just keeps going and going and it doesn't really turn on and you get this what's called hyperinflammation. And this is actually what probably kills people. It isn't the virus itself, it's the body's overreaction to the virus, right? So this is what we, the data set that we've put together is all from mouse lung and it's all this gene expression response to the virus. What we have done is we've collected over many different days, different studies, if we can, what we want to do is if we can understand this, maybe we can manipulate it. Maybe we can boost certain protective enzymes so that the virus can't get a foothold. Maybe we work on if we can understand how you get this hyperinflammation, how can we pre prevent that, right? So this is what we're trying to understand. If we can understand the host response, then hopefully we can figure out not only ways to boost the body's defenses of against this, but then we can also maybe even, and I'm gonna, show, hopefully I'll have time at the end to show you that we can find chemicals or compounds or therapeutics that'll actually help us change the host response into the good, good one. Okay. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, I went through those 34 data sets and what I came out with was 74 biosets. So when I say biosets, what I'm really indicating is that that this is a comparison. So these are 74 different comparisons. So in this particular one, if you look at the top here, I know it's kind of hard to see, it says lungs wild type, two day post SARS infection versus mock infection. So what we did is we collected all these from all these 15 studies, we collected different comparisons, looking at basically a wild type mouse infected with SARS at some day post infection versus mice that were treated with PBS, PBS, or just mock infection. So to the control animals, okay? So when we look at that, this is the kind of information we're getting. These are just some of the genes that show up and we're gonna talk about MX1 here. But again, here are all the different studies that we used. They're listed here. Here are all the full change information for that gene. And then also given here is the p-value. So we have all this information. A gene was considered significant using this program if it had a absolute full change greater than 1.2 and had a p-value less than 0 0.05, okay? And they're all treated the same way with the same criteria. And if there was no, if it wasn't expressed, then you just were basically getting a zero for that. What makes this all work is that what happens here is what we're doing is Illumina is taking, we're gonna talk about this, they scale it for you. So what they do is in each study, what they'll do is they'll rank the differentiated expression. And so those with the greatest absolute change in expression to the controls will be the highest, will be ranked 100. And everything under that is in graduated limits all the way to zero, okay? What we have done is we've, we've actually converted this. So these are all absolute scores. So what we do is we take the score and if we'll take the sign on the full change, if it's positive, then this will make our Illumina score positive. And if it was say a decrease in expression due to infection, then this will be a negative number. And I'll explain that I have a graph that kind of explains how we put this all together. Okay. So that's what we did. Um, I put all these genes in from it, it, together. I, I've sent that out to you. So 74 different comparisons or biosets. I'm just going to call them biosets for now. Um, this is a PCA plot. Everybody familiar with the PCA plot? 
principle component analysis. You should. This is people use this all the time. This is one of my favorite programs to visualize data. What we're doing is we're taking all those genes that change and we basically summarize that data in three different ways and basically plot that in three dimensional space. So given on the left, you can see day post infection. We have a half a day after infection, one day, two days, four days, and seven days. And these are all called color coded. And again, remember these are 15 different studies, but you can definitely tell. And so anything close to this axis is, is more closer to control. And as you can see, the farther the days get out from the infection, the more different you get away from control. And then you almost get this looping pattern that comes back. But what I want you to understand is that the days post-infection, even though we have different variables in our, our data set, the days post-infection seem to group together. And you can almost see this kind of looping back effect here. Here on this side, we have different... Um, I've basically, what I've done is, is color coded the different uh, virus strains that were used. These are all SARS um, MA15, which they use to infect mice to appropriate the, uh, the human ver uh, version of that. But again, you can see, you know, these are the same graphs, but you can see that we now we have differences based on what we have actually initially infected them with. And these are all, I'm going to talk about that. These are in descending order. Um, let me uh, show you a PCA plot of that real quick. That's the greatest thing about PCA plots is you can actually like take them around and look at them, right? And so now we can see, we can see where all of this stuff goes. And so anything close to each other, their expression patterns are more like each other. The farther the way they are in three-dimensional space, the more different their expression response is. I hope everybody understands that. And we can color code this any way we want. We can color it by day, we can color it by different infections, whatever we want. Uh, this program here is ClueCore. This is a commercial software. You would have to pay for it if you use it, but there are other programs out there that also have PCA plots. Okay. Okay, again, this is our data set. Now let's take a little closer look at some of the variables associated with the data set that I've given you. Um, and we're gonna use this program. Actually today, you're going to graph these two different, make these two different graphs, but this is basically showing you the different types of biosets that are in our metadata. Uh, here, what we've done is I've got day post-infection on the x-axis. So these are the days after the, the mice were initially infected. Um, we have it based on different age groups. And I, I'm sure many of you heard that the older you are, the more susceptible you are to the SARS coronavirus. So I think this is very nice that we have this information. We can compare age versus young or, or young versus old. But again, this is giving you the number of biosets in each particular not only time point, but age group. And then we've also stacked this based on the type of strain we use. Now the SARS strain that we use to infect them is very important in that different strains have different lethality on these mice. So this actually, this first one, this bat SRB2, which is colored in blue, is kind of our negative control. What they've done is they've mutated that virus to the point where it's, it's barely lethal at all. It, it actually doesn't even really do much to the animal. Um, you've got this TOR2 here. This was developed in Toronto uh, for the TOR, but this is an, again, another non-lethal viral strain. And it was actually treated, they treated young animals, which, which respond to the, my, to, the, to the virus better. And then we, we keep going up epsilon, MA15, epsilon, MA15, 15 gamma, and then the most severe one is the MA15. And as you can see, it, this is in the orange, and you can see that this is the majority of those samples that were treated. Not only do we have different viruses, but some of these studies use different initial inoculating doses. And so, and they usually refer to this as plaque forming units. So the more viruses you have, me, 
can't see here. And so just, more... while you're, just while you're interrupted there, um, Mike, I'll just butt in and say to the students, if they, if you guys have any questions, you know, sorry, Mike, but feel free to interrupt. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, I yeah. know this is a lot of stuff. So if you have any questions, please, please let me know. Thank you, Mike. Hey, hey Mike, I have a question. Sure. So I thought, like, I've heard that the mice don't get really infected by the, this virus. Uh, or like they don't express like all the pathologies uh, when they are infected by the virus. Is that correct? Um, on some of these viruses, yes. On these particular ones, no. And, and so, in fact, what they what they've done is they've, as far as I understand it, they'll take the mice and they'll take the human version, and mm -hmm. they'll just keep exposing them to the human version over and over until eventually you know, something happens and they actually, they are able to be infected. And this MA15 is a, is lethal. And in mm -hmm. fact, you can't, the, the reason you'll see that in the old mice, in the age, we only have up to day two. And that's because the old mice pretty much don't live past day two of infection. The mm -hmm. young mice so, will, the old mice will not. So, so they are kind of following what we are seeing in humans. Yes. Because, you know, I think that part of like what you're going to see that uh, when you do reverse genetics, you have to know how, what, what model to use, correct? What animal, animal model to use. And I was thinking maybe mice is not the perfect model for the SARS studies, but you're telling me that they are still following certain pathologies. Right. And I don't know if I'll have time to get into this today, but we've compared the results we've gotten with our mouse data set. And then we've looked at those results in some of the very few human studies on the current epidemic, and we're getting pretty much the same stuff. So it's, okay. I, I, I feel it's very relevant. Well, it's good to know. Thank you. But keep, uh, keep for the students this in mind that when you are studying something, you always have to think of the model organism that you're going to use in your research. Because they need to also follow some of those pathologies. If not, you cannot use that model. Yes, correct. Um, yeah, and and that was the thing is we also there was some some macaque studies in there, and also God, what was the other one? There was macaque and ferret. <laughs> and we were we tried to eventually, you know, originally try to combine that in this data set, but I, I think that data was just too different done on different strains, different time points. So it was very difficult. So I think your, your data can be different, you know, and obviously you can see the very different variables in our study, but sometimes, you know, you, you have to avoid comparing apples to oranges. And I think, especially with the ferret data, they used a dog uh, microarray to measure it. And as you can imagine, there's all kinds of problems with annotation and, you know, different variables associated with, you know, using one species to, to measure another. So, so I, I think you, you're right. Like there, I could give a whole lecture on, you know, what data should you use? But if, so for, for this instance, we used all mouse data and we only took time points that had more than one measurement on it. Okay. Oops. There we go. Um, so it's not only can we measure, like, even before we get into like the genes itself, you know, we, we can look at certain other aspects of the data set, you know, just like we did with the PCA to give us an idea. So in this instance, what we're doing is we're graphing the number of genes that change significantly in each study. And as you can see here on the left, again, here are our different viral strains, our SARS strains, right? Again, here is this one that was engineered to not be very lethal at all. In fact, probably a null virus. And you can see very little genetic change, not very many genes that go up and down. Again, we go up one more. This is TOR2. Uh, you can see, again, you're getting more than this one. You kind of get this elevation here. Lots of about 5,000 genes change here, and then it goes back down. Now we start going up into the different data set or the different severity of viruses. And now you can see larger increases. Now we're getting up to almost 12,000 genes that change. And we're separated here. You got the blue is young and the green is aged. You can see that 
very similar here in the smaller strains, but as you get into the higher strains, you notice that the old mice tend to produce or have more significant genes that change at day one than the young mice do. And that actually gets increases when we get to the most severe strain of virus. There's, I don't know how people have been following this virus, but there's this, there's been quite a few papers that I've seen where their belief is that somehow this virus is suppressing the immune system. And in my opinion, just looking at the number of genes that change, you know, we're not really seeing that. You know, we, we know the old individuals are definitely more susceptible to this virus and they're getting way more changes in gene expression than the actual young ones. And then the red is the adult mice. Uh, again, we can look over here. This is different viral doses. These were all done with, well, actually, yeah. So these are different viral doses, initial. Uh, as you can see, as we increase the initial viral concentration with infection, the more earlier the changes in gene expression, the greater and earlier these changes in gene expression go. Again, kind of not really going with the whole, you know, with more virus, you get you know, suppression of this immune system. Uh, at least as far as like the number of genes that change, I'm, I'm not seeing this. So again, these are just some of these things that it's not just the genes itself you're analyzing, it's what's coming off them. So this is, you can almost consider this meta meta metadata, right? Your information on information. So all I'm doing is just trying to get an idea of what's going on. And what I realize is that Based on this, I would say that the more severe strains are going to induce more genes. And the more concentrated those that virus is at the beginning, the earlier and more intense the response in gene expression. Okay. And so what we're going to do is I'm just going to give you kind of a brief overview. I'm going to take two points on here. They were both at day two. This was done with the TOR2 strain. And I'm going to compare this bio set where this old one using, so these are old animals with the most severe strain. So these are very two diverse bio sets. Basically, I'm going to use that as an example to explain how we can combine all this data. Uh, given here are just some of the, you know, the variables associated with the two bio sets that I pointed out. Uh, we have different genes. So this is feature size. These are a number of genes that changed, uh, almost, you know, twice as many changed in the more severe old animals than the less severe uh, virus with the young animals. We also, these are different types of mice that were used in this experiment. We also, again, host stage and different array platforms. So the TOR2 is measured with affymetrics and the MA or the older ones with more severe type where the gene expression was measured with Agilent. Again, two different lab groups, but they did do it in the same year. Hi, can you um, quickly re like remind us the difference between those array platforms? Sure, um, they all kind of work on the same principle. Agilent's a little different. Um, uh, Agilent will have the B technology. Affymetrix has the, it's kind of the gene chips is what they've, they've really formatted. Um, I would say microarray expression. So these are all measuring hybridization. So what you've done is you've put, you, you basically, you, you create a template, you create different oligonucleotides specific to different areas on the mRNA. And then what you do is you put the RNA from your sample on it it hybridizes to the correct spot. You wash all the nonspecific binding out. And what you're left with is, is these hybridized things to these templates. And you, you basically label them with fluorescence. The microarray is different than RNA-seq. And that's another reason why we want to scale data is if anybody's done RNA-seq, what you're doing is you're actually measuring the transcript itself. So as you're basically figuring out the sequence of that mRNA, you're counting how many reads that you're getting. So it's RNA-seq is way more sensitive than microarray. And I will say that if I was gonna get either one of those, RNA-seq or microarray data to measure expression, I probably want microarray data because it's not as sensitive and it actually kind of evens out all these like variables. And so it's actually better to kind of get you an idea of, of 
expression than, than actual RNA-seq. Uh, given here is just, the, these are the full change for the data sets. Uh, this is just the distribution of that. And if we look down here, so what we do is we take the top one is ranked 100, and the bottom one here is kind of met on the negative side, so there'd be a negative 100. So what we're doing is we're basically scaling all this information into a negative 100 and a 100 scale. And we do the same thing for the next one, right? The lowest one goes down here, the highest one goes here, and everything's scaled in between those two. So now everything is, you know, we've kind of got this diverse and you'll, you'll see it on the next graph a lot better, but now everything's in the same scale. So again, we've got 74 different biosets or comparisons, but they're all in the same scale. So that's why we can combine all this data and look at it together. Uh, this is just an XY plot of the same information. Again, this is the full change information here on the left. This is the, the young mice treated with a weak strain, and this is the old mice treated with a more severe strain. You can see the higher the full change gets, the more skewed the data gets. And you can see everything's bunched up here. But now once we take the Illumina scores, the normalized Illumina scores, now we can see everything's kind of on the same scale. Um, and you can see the R value. So we've got an R squared value of 0.5 here. Now we're at an R squared value of almost 0.7. So everything's on the same scale. So this is the data we're looking at. So if you see a gene with a 100, that was the highest ranked gene, gene with the highest ranked change in that particular data set. And again, everything's ranked from 100 to negative 100. Does everybody understand that? If you don't understand that, let me know. Great. Would I'm sorry, I wasn't fast enough. So a, a score of a negative 100 would be the lowest change? Yes. Thank you. Yep. So all we're doing is we're taking the normalized Illumina scores. You, you take the absolute change compared to the control, and then you're just going from 100 to zero. And the only thing we change to that, what we're getting from Illumina is we're actually making, we're taking those scores and we're either making it positive or negative based on the full change. So everything will be, all data points are between negative 100 and positive 100. Okay. So that's what we're gonna do right now. So let's take our, we're gonna look at, oops. We're gonna look at our, we're gonna upload this data set that I've, I've given you and then we're gonna start analyzing it. So let me end the show.